Welcome to this event discussion on AI and copyright here at Think Corner. Uh, as AI is able to create more and more, we need to ask who owns the rights to the creations. What kinds of legal guidelines do we need for creatives working with AI? Can we use copyrighted works for training artificial intelligence? Can AI ownership be democratic? This event is part of a series discussing the impacts of AI and creative technologies from different perspectives, organized jointly by Aalto University and the University of Helsinki. Today, we will first hear three presentations by our keynote speakers, Mirko Musalesi, Anet Alen, and Natalia Särmakari. After that, we'll invite them back to the stage for a panel discussion, and then we'll take audience questions. Uh, you at the audience here at Think Corner or following the stream can send in the questions through our online platform. Here at Think Corner, you can see the address over there on the wall. So you can type that in and send us questions, and you following the stream can see the address uh, on the screen. We certainly hope for a lot of questions, and I will bring them in during the event. My name is Anu Partanen. Now I'd like to invite to the stage our first speaker and a very special guest star, Mirko Musalesi. Mirko is professor of computer science at both the University College London and the University of Bologna. At University College London, he also leads the machine intelligence lab. Welcome, Thank Mirko. Thanks for the introduction. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. So today I am going to... Uh, introduce this discussion giving the perspective uh, of a computer scientist. And uh, the per part uh, particular perspective that I'm going to give you is a perspective of essentially of, uh, from the problem of uh, designing uh, machines that create and uh, also framing the problem of uh, uh, creation and creativity uh, from the, if you want, computational perspective. So this is a problem that has been uh, considered since uh, the beginning of computer science itself. Uh, this is the paper uh, from Alan Turing, the famous paper of the imitation game, where essentially uh, uh, Turing essentially says, I propose to consider the question, can machine think? And then he starts also talking about like, the possibility of machines that are original, and it, it, actually he, uh, he argues for machines that can create in, the, in this paper. And this essentially has been like a, a thread uh, across computer science for, for decades. It's not that the AI is something of, of the last like, couple of years or last decade. It's been like something like from, from the 60s, uh, you see here like a... Uh, um, a quote from uh, Herbert Simon uh, that says, the simplest way I can summarize the situation is to say that there are now in the world machines that think, that learn and create. This is 1958. Moreover, their ability to do these things is going to increase rapidly until in a visible future, the range of problems they can handle will be coextensive with the range to which the human mind has been applied. So this is 1958, Albert Simon, double prize, <laughs> double uh, Nobel Prize winner, <laughs> uh, economist and computer scientist, was talking about uh, machines that can create, that are able to create. And we saw the, uh, the progress in, uh, in, in AI from uh, solving games and finding in this game creative orig uh, and original uh, solution. We saw... Uh, like everyone used uh, like lang large language models that are doing things that are just uh, just incredible. Like for someone like uh, that has been working in the area for many decades now, <laughs> I can say uh, this is something that is still amaze me every time I, I use uh, I use these tools. Like, uh, and I told you like this is kind of an experience over a, a period like since I was a kid essentially. Uh, but this new realization, the fact that we can see essentially an artist, as, as this uh, his book from Arthur Miller says, in the machine is still 
something that is, uh, is just unthinkable. It was, it was just unthinkable until like, uh, until, like very, very few years ago. And uh, thinking about also like how this uh, evolved from the machine of Babbage, this is uh, at the Science Museum in London, that we were thinking, okay, this machine can really build, uh, like it really creates. And then we see like that since Babbage actually someone was already thinking about machine that can create, but is later, to this uh, super powerful GPUs that we have today, the theme here is again is the same. Can we build machines that essentially replicate uh, the human creativity? And what is the difference between human creativity, original thinking of humans, and original thinking of machines? As I told you, like uh, there is has been like this kind of uh, evolution over time uh, um, of, of these of technologies, and I would say that I I witnessed witnessed like like uh, would I say three. A very big uh, a revolution. One was the introduction of the web, uh, like in the 90s. It was not, uh, say, I was younger. <laughs> uh, and then uh, clearly the, ad the advent of mobile compu computing, and if you want, smartphones. And then this revolution that we have right now. And I think this idea, like the fact that. Uh, we are really like this kind of step change, that everything changed, and everything needs to think about uh, new opportunities and also new risks, uh, and also really rethink what we, what we also have in terms of, for example, of regulation that we are talking about, and especially in a context where what is uh, possible is still not really clear at the moment. So the fact that we need to be prepared to, uh, so we are in a very fast-changing uh, uh, revolution, I would say. So this question, like, can machine be creative? How do machine create? I think is like a key question. I, and this question was asked for the first time from the first uh, computer scientist, the first computer scientist that Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace was, uh, was actually like uh, the, the, the daughter of Lord Byron. Uh, I don't know, uh, Ada Lovelace, uh, essentially, uh, the mother didn't want that the daughter was going to become a poet, so it was the first, probably, person like, like pushing STEM uh, subjects, and essentially uh, asked, uh, what well, was essentially tutored, uh, Ada was tutored in order to study math. And, and one thing that, that Ada did was to write uh, the, the manual uh, for, uh, for uh, for, a, uh, um, for, for the first computer, there was the analytical engine by Charles Babbage. And this was the, 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 analytical, the analytical engine. It was never built, but, uh, but now we have a reconstruction because we have the manual. That, the interesting thing is that Ada was, uh, was, uh, uh, did was uh, to write uh, the notes because she translated from this manual, there was a manual by, by Menabrea, it's called the sketch of the analytical engine. And if, if you haven't read that before, I think it is a fascinating, a fascinating reading. So reading the, the notes written by Ada, that she, was, she just translated it, she talks about how to write programs, uh, the, the notes have also the first bug, <laughs> because there is a bug in the program of Ada, and it's, it's very, very interesting reading. But I think, it, I think that is important here is, like Ada was asking also, she, she was like quite sure that machine cannot create. And, and it is really written, this is like uh, 18, 18, uh, mid, mid, mid of the 19th century. Uh, Ada was, well, this was, I think it was 1843, Okay, Ada says, okay, machine cannot create anything original. And this is like uh, back to the discussion that we are going to have uh, about uh, uh, copyright and also about what is the real invention. And also because they think that Ada was saying essentially machine really cannot really experience and generate anything new. The analytical engine has no pretension whatever to origi originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. It can follow analysis, 
but it has no power of anticipating an analytical relation of truth. So essentially, it's not able to create. This is, is quite important in our, in our discussion. Turing really disagree with Ada, but thinking about, uh, also for the, our future discussion, about what is human creativity and what is something that is generated by my machine, I think it would, is key for this discussion. This is a, a discussion also like, what is, what is creativity? Okay. And uh, again, like a, this is like a, um, a very interesting uh, book by Margaret Boden. Uh, uh, she is a philosopher at the University of Sussex. And uh, Margaret Boden studied human and artificial creativity. Uh, the characteristics of creativity for Margaret Boden, and I think this is quite accepted because it's quite a very concise way for defining creativity, is uh, that a, something that is creative has the characteristic of being novel, being uh, surprising, being uh, of value. Novel is very difficult to understand what is novel, and I think this will guide our discussion later with the other, uh, with the other members of the panel. Uh, what, but it's usually something that is surprising, okay? That is, like what is creative? It's something that is surprises us. Uh, but it's at the same time, if, uh, if uh, a chat GPT is going to, uh, to generate gibberish, gibberish will be of no value. So novelty, surprise, value. And the thing that is quite interesting is that our, our, the, our like uh, the state of the art of a uh, AI system is based on an architecture that is, this architecture that is the attention architecture, that the former architecture based on the attention mechanism that is quite different from the architecture of our brain at the end. And I think here it would be interesting also to discuss about this. There is a, a big bit of a difference between the substrate of computers and subject of humans. And this is my point will be, is that as humans, we have this process of creation that is also intentional, if you want. So we write, we paint, and this essentially comes from, a process, from several processes. First of all, we acquire information. And the acquisition of information comes from, from reading, from studying, from elaborating information that we acquire. This uh, comes from observing previous uh, works of art, for example. If I go to the, to the Uffizi in Florence, I, I will be surrounded by art. And, and this art inspires, artists inspires also everyone. And, this is an example, uh, these are examples that we, we can use as starting points for our work. And what is different then between uh, like humans that create and machines that create? First point. Then this comes also through information exchange. So this is, comes also from like usually brainstorming to like, like exchanging ideas. And again, what is the difference, and this is like a question that I would like also to ask to the audience and to also to, to like, like this, also we'll discuss maybe also like in, uh, in the panel later. The, what is the difference between machine that changing, that is changing information, human machines that are changing information, and humans that are changing information, and the brainstorm? And I think this is like an important point. Uh, learning also happens through experience personal experience. And creation is about uh, experience, experiencing particular uh, life events. Uh, we know like poets like, uh, or writers, uh, like the, their best work comes also from their life. And uh, it is original also because it is uh, lived in, uh, in the first person. What about a, a computer? What about a machine? This is something that a machine probably, at the moment at least, cannot do. And uh, 
because here we have also this implementation of embodiment. So machine at the moment are not embodied. So this is an interesting question that I think we should ask. Creativity through experience, because it is experience that can be also like experience like of, of like watching like a, a corals, a, like, watch, like, like a looking at a mountain. This is like a subjective experience. And subjective experience is something very different that the machine probably is not able to do. And also is about also challenging experiences and, and, and creativity uh, and also like original work is also through this type of, uh, it's not only through limit, imitation, but to go through difficult, difficult situation and, and, and solving challenges. And then uh, the final, if you want, like a final way that I, I, I'm pointing out is uh, uh, imagination. So imagination, that is something that uh, is important uh, and is very difficult, but possible at the moment we have a sample of imagination also to, to replicate a machine. But what does it mean, imagination? What is the difference between imitation and imagination? Again, I think these are points that, that I think is worthwhile discussing later with uh, the other panelists. Uh, I want uh, also to uh, give you like some if you want pointers to read more about uh, this, uh, and, and I would point to, to some of our work if you are interested in reading more about uh, this type of work. So we, for example, uh, study how to find new solution, like to problems, uh, and it's like the paper is called The Do Agents Dream of Electric Ship. Uh, this is a very recent paper, trying to understand if uh, by essentially imagining like a dreamlike imagination, uh, new experiences as we do in dreams, if you think about it, in dreams, so there are at least some theories that say that dreams are used in order to imagine a new situation and, uh, and is even a, an evolutionary adaptation to try to think about things that are different and situations that are different and try to find even a solution to this situation that are different. Can we replicate this in machine? Yes, it's possible, because we can uh, try to generate new experiences and train on this. This is a work uh, with uh, 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 one of my PhD students, uh, Giorgio Franceschelli, that is uh, working on these topics and he is doing a very interesting work in this area. And I, I really suggest you to look at his work. And in general, uh, this um, is, a, is a, like a, opens, I think, a lot of questions, okay? Because when you have uh, like humans and machines that create and co-create, there are questions about uh, what is uh, acceptable in order to, uh, uh, in order to replication, because mach this machine can replicate very well. But what is also about uh, originality? And how to distinguish the two? My point is that uh, there is one thing, we have like the, this creation of, of, uh, of uh, the individual, okay? That is one of also um, the points that are usually uh, like also underlined in the law. So the individual creation. We have also this point about, uh, uh, if you want, uh, the creation of something that is different, okay, from what is already there. But measuring this, I think, is extremely challenging, and regulating this is extremely challenging. And so this is, might be, might be uh, problematic for artists, but artists have now also the possibilities of uh, augmenting their, uh, the, the, their creative power through these tools. Looking at these as tools, as powerful tools, I think uh, open up a lot of uh, interesting direction. But I'm very aware that this is a destabilizing force because we are creating machines that have capabilities that are very similar to the capabilities of humans. And especially, specifically for large 
language models and for foundational models, these capabilities are indeed uh, really something extremely surprising again. Things that are like unexpected. Okay, we have seen emergence of certain, uh, of certain capabilities that are unexpected. How to regulate this? How to regulate the emergence of unexpected capabilities? I think it's a big question. And I think, uh, like to conclude also my talk, uh, the interesting, uh, why, why I think I, I'm so excited about this area is the fact that uh, like working on the design of the AI system essentially, uh, essentially make you ask you questions uh, that are also like uh, quite fundamental questions. If these machines are able to replicate uh, or to show capabilities that are, that are quite, the quite distinguishing aspects of being humans, so what being human is all about might become also like uh, an underlying, if you want, philosophical question of general interest that I think uh, it is uh, originated, it is raised uh, looking at, uh, at the, at the uh, progress that we observed in the past, past couple of years, I would say. Okay. And I think the other thing that it is clear, we are just at the beginning. We are just at the beginning. And also when we are going to talk about uh, a regulation of these technologies, we need just to think about that we are just at the beginning. So what being human is all about, what being a machine is all about, and how also humans and machines can cooperate, I think will be one of the big questions of our uh, near future. Thanks, everyone, for the attention. Thank you, Mirko. You can hand me the clicker. So if you have any questions for Mirko, please send them in via the online platform, and I'll bring them to him when he comes back to the stage. Now, next, we will turn the stage over to Annette Allen. Annette is Professor of Civil and Commercial Law at the University of Helsinki. Welcome, Thanks. Annette. Thank you. Okay, there was a nice, uh, what's it called, some sort of a bridge there to my uh, presentation. Um, yes, I will actually uh, talk a little bit about my title first, because of course we need to take into account what Mirko said about AI-generated creativity <laughs> in, in his speak. But, uh, and also maybe a few words about myself. So, uh, I am a, a lawyer uh, and a legal scholar uh, and a social scientist uh, to the extent that is seen on the, on the slide. Uh, but here today uh, speaking as a, as a researcher, not a lawyer, uh, but also a researcher that has, uh, uh, besides legal scholarship, I have done uh, some research on, on uh, uh, the communication between humans and machines, uh, and then uh, communication studies in general, since my uh, speciality, so to say, is communication law uh, in a wider sense, like digitalization and AI included. Um, and what I would like to uh, take up is the kind of a copyright in a nutshell. So what we are talking about when we talk about copyright uh, is, like Mirko said, originality. Um, uh, there is the kind of a requirement uh, when we talk about legal copyright uh, that the work uh, that is protected is uh, original. Uh, and I will talk about that a little bit later. Then. Uh, copyright also includes exclusive rights and limitations, and we'll have a look at that a little later. And then uh, I will talk about the specifics of, of 
uh, generative AI and what is uh, copyright relevant in that context. And then also, uh, what are the applicable uh, uh, exceptions and limitations in that context. And then a few notes about the differences between EU and US, because I'm like um, talk all the time talking about European copyright uh, and, and uh, as a European lawyer in that sense. Uh, and then some notes on democratization. But let's start uh, with this uh, basic, so to say. Uh, in a general uh, sense, uh, and legally speaking, it's not a question of ownership, uh, uh, traditional uh, way of seeing things. Of course, I know ownership can be talked in a, another way than, than legalese. But it's uh, more, more of a right holder, uh, author and right holder. So uh, if I buy a book, I, I own that book, but I don't own the work uh, that the book contains. So this is a very simple uh, uh, example. And then, like I said, um, originality is the European uh, copyright way of approaching protection. We, of course, have different types of uh, re related rights and stuff like that, but to keep it simple, we talk about this uh, originality proper. And that includes, uh, according to the European Court of Justice, uh, personal touch, uh, creative choices, free and creative choices, uh, and so on. Then, like I said, uh, we have uh, copyright is, is not uh, only one-way street. It has these exclusive rights, uh, both economic and moral. So they are about uh, having exclusive right to copying uh, uh, and then also communicating it to the public. In, in, there are many ways to do it. And then uh, we should know that the copying is uh, traditionally a very technical thing. So when you copy, it's copying, uh, uh, like very simple thing. But on the other hand, uh, it's also wider. So you have your exclusive rights to altered uh, adaptive uh, forms of your work also. And then with regard to moral rights, uh, you have the right to be named as the author and, and it shouldn't uh, be like derogative use of your work. And then, like I said, the uh, kind of a one big thing uh, or the other side of the coin is these exceptions and limitations. Uh, there are so-called full exceptions based on law that you can cite somebody and not pay for it, not ask permission to do it, and so on. But of course, there are conditions. Uh, what is a citation in that regard? Uh, whether it's remuneration based or not. And then we have actually just received this new copyright uh, in the digital single market directive with the uh, text and data mining. Uh, rules. But of course, you should always note that copyright uh, also means contracting, licensing, and then various uh, services, of course, can have their own terms and conditions and, and so on for users. So it's, uh, it can be something else than copyright in that regard. And then, uh, I'm not a US lawyer, but just a few notes. Uh, uh, and, and despite kind of an international framework, we have um, for, for no formalities, uh, there is this regi registration part in the US for certain uh, infringement proceedings and so on uh, that we don't have here. So they can uh, maybe discuss this AI issue already in that uh, stage, whereas we, uh, for us, it comes at some other point. Then they have a work for hire doctrine, where the rights can actually uh, be born, uh, so to say, straight to a, a company, whereas for us, it's always a human being. And then, uh, instead of these uh, very uh, individual uh, exceptions and limitations, they have a 
fair use doctrine, uh, which is, of course, it's not like limitless, but it's uh, somewhat more uh, flexible and based on case law. And then uh, they have a different uh, outlook on moral rights, uh, kind of a narrow, uh, more narrow than us. And here are the few things that are, um, that I would like to say about the copyright relevance. So for AI, everything is kind of data. Uh, it doesn't perceive the works or does it, like Mirko uh, asked, uh, perceive the work uh, like humans do, like humans uh, feel it or experience it. Uh, but for copyright, it's kind of a technical thing. Of course, there is research on this and, and uh, science it is not like uh, done yet with this issue. But in any case, uh, this part uh, deals with the input and the training data, which can include copyright protected materials. And then we have the output part. So uh, can something that com comes out from the AI get protected? Uh, and this is where the kind of the human loop comes in. So uh, uh, we have these uh, kind of a hidden, hidden causation requirements, as our colleague puts it there, that uh, the creative choices, the personal touch, uh, have to be caused by human beings. And if the machine kind of uh, uh, stops that chain, uh, like the monkey did with the selfie, we had that case in the US. So even if there are some things, of course, that the human did, uh, the monkey did something in between and, and it wasn't uh, uh, a protected work. But then um, the infringement part has, has also come up lately, that is something that comes out from the AI also infringing. Is it... Um, like I said, you have the exclusive right to even uh, adaptations and alterations uh, and, of course, direct copies of your work. Uh, and then just a few words about the AI Act that just uh, uh, a very short time ago was accepted. Uh, so at the European level, we now have uh, actually a horizontal uh, regulation for for AI, and it includes these references to European copyright regime and compliance policy therein, and then these date, uh, text and data mining rules and the the uh, like the part where uh, right holders can opt out uh, from this text and data mining. And then just a few notes on democratization. What is it? that we mean by that in this regard? Is it who, who develops these based on what? Who regulates and rules? Is it, uh, when we talk about copyright, is it more of an open source issue? Uh, is it data sets that are like public utility? Uh, what about the opt-outs? They are privately enforced in the de uh, at the development stage. Is that democratic? And then finally, with regard to tech companies and companies in general, what is democracy? Uh, when they um, develop these tools, is it democracy by design? And what kind of democracy uh, is it? Because I read this uh, article and to me, democracy is more of a dialogue uh, and, and uh, like opinions that crisscross. And there, the idea was to find the smallest possible cons consensual space. So this is where I, I'm going to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Then and again, please send in your questions via the online platform and we'll bring them to Annette later. And now we'll give the stage to our final keynote speaker, Natalia Sarmakari. Natalia is postdoctoral researcher at Aalto University and she's focused on digital fashion and the profession of fashion designer. She's also a member of the EDA Consortium, aka Intimacy in Data Driven Culture. 
Welcome, Natalia. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So nice to see you all here. Um, Oh, so, uh, so from, from the field of design research and fashion studies. So this is my point of view on, on this topic. Um, and I, I got interested in, um, in this topic um, because many years ago when all this digitalization started and there has been so much of very idealistic thoughts on the democratization and uh, decentralization of creative work. Um, and then I started thinking like how this affects the work of fashion designer, um, because that was also my original uh, profession. So that's why I uh, ended up uh, doing a PhD on, on this topic and also now as a postdoc in this project. And so digital fashion, it's, it's basically what, um, it's, it's, it's this phenomenon that is emerging at the moment uh, and which quite explicitly questions the role of authorship um, and other ideals of, uh, of the world of fashion design. And it refers to digital representations of uh, existing or possible products, or then to digital only fashion products that can be uh, worn on real bodies in, in digital spaces or on avatars or just as collectibles. And uh, usually quite advanced and smart digital software is used to create such products. But what is interesting about this phenomenon, it's also building a new kind of culture of fashion that um, also builds a subversive discourse um, that questions uh, kind of the principles of, of the design profession, such as um, authorship, uh, the body, the materiality, and professional boundaries in general but also kind of zooms into them and unveils their importance. And this importance is quite visible in, in works of such designers. For example, this one, it's closer to craftsmanship than to kind of uh, traditional fashion design work because this, these designers, they actually um, kind of make those garments uh, in the digital space, they have to know how to sew the garments, but these are also uh, th these also become physical. But in this case, uh, this company actually kind of introduced the idea of fashion being used only digitally or created only digitally. They don't produce anything physical, um, and they also introduced the idea of uh, digital garments being very valuable. Uh, and both of these companies actually uh, have been sharing their models um, and patterns online for the others to, uh, to build on or to modify. So it's very important for them to kind of talk about authorship in a more shared way. But this... Uh, company uh, also created back in 2018 um, a collection and they refer to it or, or, or they talk about it as, as if they would be collaborating with AI or um, kind of as, as a companion or uh, as a co-designer. And they used uh, Paris Fashion Week uh, photos as a data set uh, that was fed to generative adversarial nets. And then these, they created this model or these algorithm networks created these blurry images, which the designers then uh, turned into very specific, uh, detailed 
uh, 3D models, out, outfits, and then also kind of uh, environments and uh, videos, experience, passion experiences. Um, but now, these uh, more recent uh, AI tools, with, the, with them we can, we can create really detailed images that look like they're real, or, or maybe a bit surreal also, but more detailed in a way how this, uh, the fabric and the previous, uh, or digital fashion in general, if they serve the kind of virtual layer, the imaginary layer of fashion, which has always been really important in this culture, here, um, they, they kind of raise questions on whether this kind of layer needs humans anymore. But in a way, these pictures are still really weird, so depending on the prompt, course and given to them, uh, but they merge all sorts of elements then uh, and create this, well, kind of realistic but still kind of weird things. <clears throat> but there are also other ways of using AI in fashion design. So if these previous ones was mainly the images based on which people can then do whatever they want. Uh, the AI can also be used for production or for uh, solving very complex problems in kind of structural problems. And for example, this designer um, has been automating his own um, uh, design process and wants to replace himself with AI, but it's kind of a conceptual, conceptual uh, work. But anyway, he's been using uh, the algorithm that, that he writes himself to solve kind of very difficult uh, structural problems in the physical garments that he then uh, makes. But anyway, he's using and he's teaching his own knowledge as a designer to this, uh, uh, to the computer. So to sum up, um, no matter how much the uh, authorship is questioned by digital fashion design culture, there is still a lot of space for the human and, and it's needed. And the embodied and cultural and ethical uh, knowledge of the human. And uh, it's, well, in the end, it's, it's the question not, not only about uh, what kind of funny things can be done with AI, but also what kind of things uh, should actually be done, so and who should take responsibility of those things. Thanks. Thank you, Natalia. Please sit down and we'll invite Mirko and Annette to come and join us back here on stage. I see we already have a lot of questions. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but let's start with a round um, I'd love to hear from each of you when you were listening to your co-panelists' talks. You come from quite different perspectives. Uh, what did you pick up on or think when you were listening to your co-panelists? We could all share and do a little round. Should we start with Anet? Yeah, I made some notes, actually. Very, very interesting. So uh, the first thing that I also mentioned in, in my talk was the thing that we can talk like le in legal terms and we can talk in other terms. So it's also good to keep in mind when we talk about ownership or whatever, that what are we actually talking about when we talk like cross-disciplinary and so on. Um, and uh, all this with what is creativity, um, the question is of course, from a legal or copyright perspective, uh, that what is creativity in that regard? Creativity can be, of course, many things, but who needs like incentives for creative labor? Uh, who needs these natural law rewards for their creative labor? Um, who's person enough to bring the personal touch and so on. Uh, 
And also these uh, artsy questions about uh, is AI bringing only kind of statistical probabilities, whereas art would go beyond and, and look at possibilities, uh, human experiences, or possibilities based on human experience, like, like you pointed out. And then also what, is, what fashion brought to my mind was this mind, of course, but body, mind and body. Uh, materiality was great also, like information processing is different from uh, experience, feeling, uh, something metaphysical, unexplainable, uh, unexpected, and so on. So I think there are, this is really interesting to, to continue this talk. Mirko. So, uh, I, I think uh, like one thing that is clear uh, from, from the discussion, from the presentation, is that this is not a problem that I think uh, computer scientists uh, are, would be able to solve alone, but it, this is like a problem where really like people from different disciplines need really to, to talk uh, deeply and interact. And uh, also because I think there is uh, like a, an important aspect here that is like, especially also when you think about uh, how to use these tools, like also if you're a computer scientist, let's say, you decide to use these tools, maybe also even for coding, for example, like thinking about uh, what are the implications of what you are doing, also or when you are designing this system, is fundamental. And also, I think like, uh, and coming also for, from the, the third talk, uh, also thinking about who are actually the users of, of, of this in the, in the practice. So the fact that there's also an aspect of regulation, there is a practice, there is a, the people that design the system. Uh, and also, I, I, like, I, I like a lot of this, uh, this point about uh, democratization. So it is the fact that uh, if we teach also people to use these tools, I think we are going to give uh, superpower to people. And, and, and uh, think about like, if you ask some, I don't know, you, you want to write a letter, I don't know, a letter of complaint to, to the council, and you are worried about that your letter will be not in, in good Finnish or in good English and so on. Then you have a tool that is essentially fix the points, and, and so it's a superpower. With a superpower comes responsibility, and the responsibility is a problem, like thinking about, uh, like this can be also misused. It might be used like uh, to, to reuse uh, like, like, like creation of other people. This is a problem that we already have, no? We have, we have a serious problem. Like in academia, we have people that plagiarize papers. In, uh, in fashion, I'm pretty sure that there are people that copy, uh, we know actually, the people that copy the creation of other, of other people, or of other cre um, creators. And I think the problem is uh, how to use this well. And the, but this aspect of having a Seeing these, these tools as something that is for everyone, I think it is key. But and also teaching, teaching people how to use them in a responsible way. And, and this comes really from, from the discussion from the creators. Also like how to translate, for example, like, like regulation and, and, and law that you, that you mentioned as well, and, and explain that to people, explain that to, to students, explain to practitioners, I think that is also quite key. It's, it's plain also to computer scientists, because like, mm -hmm. this is uh, maybe difficult to, to grasp uh, the actual meaning of certain terms as well. Mm -hmm. That are maybe, I, you're talking about doctrine, I, I know what it is, but I think that it is a concept that might be interpreted in different ways. No? Yeah, um, I also came to think of, of of what is creativity and originality uh, when listening to both of your talks. And of course, also what is human, <laughs> to what extent uh, we can define a human and when human, when human stops being human and so on. Um, because historically there has been also kind of dehumanization of, of certain human groups as well in a way that who, who is the originator who is the author who, who comes to, to be one. But about creativity, 
as you were uh, talking about these different levels also of, of creativity, that there is kind of a more a superficial creativity maybe where things are synth synthesized based on what we see and observe or based on existing things, which is quite typical of what we do also as original uh, creators. So our originality is maybe never as original as we think. And it's also interesting from the legal perspective, what is original enough? Um, so, yes, I think this, these aspects are really interesting. And also maybe, uh, I think Margaret Bowden has written something about this, kind of different levels of, of creativity. Um, so maybe there are there some limits, what kind of creativity uh, machines can achieve? And then is there a level of creativity that kind of makes actually something different? I think you used the word different. So create something actually different and makes a difference in the history of arts or design or whatever. So maybe that's something that is harder to explain or to teach to, uh, to AI because it can be really surprising and uh, yes. But the legal question of authorship is also kind of tricky because, well, in fashion, for example, it's to my knowledge, I'm not an expert in that, but to, to my knowledge, it's, it's really hard to kind of pinpoint what is original enough because it always builds on, on the history, on the brand, on the body of the human. So there are always a lot of, a lot of limiting things that might kind of... Um, strip the author from authorship in a way. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to think about those and how, how AI kind of, what's the role of AI in, in such creativity if, if it if it's goes more towards the image creation than maybe there is even more authorship of, of humans involved compared to kind of basic design work. I want to just start, I'll bring us down a notch to a very practical level. Um, so sort of bring to Annette's um, uh, slide where you had the inputs and outputs. So there's the question of um, the data that's used to train the AI, and then there's the question of the work that comes out and the copyright. So I wanted to first ask about the, the training of AI, which is perhaps the aspect that many of us know the best, because there's been several lawsuits in the US. The, the New York Times has sued OpenAI and Microsoft for copyright infringement for using their articles without permission, without pay, to train AI. Uh, the actress Sarah Silverman has joined lawsuits that have accused Meta and OpenAI of using and ingested her memoir as a training tool for AI. Uh, there's several novelists who have expressed alarm that their books have just been put into the software and, and used to train AI without permission. And Getty Images has also sued uh, one AI company for using their pictures as training data. Um, just yesterday, The Guardian was reporting that a group of more than 200 high-profile musicians uh, has signed an open letter calling for protections against the predator use of artificial intelligence that mimics human artist likeness, voices and sound. So essentially, uh, they're worried that their voice and their images are put in there to train it and then outcomes exactly what they have produced. Um, they, and I quote, the letter says, um, this assault on human creativity must be stopped. We must protect against the predator use of AI to steal professional artists' voices and likeness, violate creators' rights, and destroy the music ecosystem, the letter states. Um, let's start with this of what do we put in? What do you think? What should we think about this copyright question of how to train AI, whether it is these um, gigantic tech companies or somebody wanting to create their own software for their own uses. What do you think, Mirko? So I, I think is, this is like, a, a, it is really a societal question. So like, I think it is, we need to agree what uh, we think as society as permissible or not. Uh, there is a question of, uh, question of fair use that was raised before. Uh, 
thinking about what I think, I think what we are now is that uh, this is not really well defined. The, que the question for me is the following. So I, I, I talk about like people like, I don't know, start like going to, I don't know, to exhibition and, and looking at work of art to get inspiration. Pe like music musician, we know that musicians essentially are trained by listening to music and, and, and also playing music of other musicians. Uh, writers writers uh, have uh, usually are trained themselves like reading also other writers. What is changing here is the scale. So the scale and the, the speed of the training. Uh, there is a question clearly of uh, how do we attribute value to this work? and how, how this is also interpreted in the law. But I, so like my point of view at the moment is, uh, is a question of deciding like as a society how, how we uh, limit potentially, how we reward the use of uh, work that is, is being produced by others. There is a, clearly a question about, uh, and I don't have an answer, about the implication of this for for example, for artists, because cer certain type of like this pure reproduction might be a problem because like this is a, a key imitation. So we are actually now able to do systems that are extremely good in imitating uh, style. It voices clearly the uh, the one 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 of the characteristics that we are able to um, to imitate extremely well. The question there is. Uh, like what, what would be like the implications for artists? What would be the implication for professors teaching? Because like, like if it will be like, I think it will not be quite easy to, to have like in very few years, like time to have like having like, like professor lecturers that are just teaching, I don't know, introduction to programming very well. <laughs> because like, 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 like singing is much more difficult than teaching how to program, in my opinion, no, is like, if you think about it. Like, and, and, and I think that there are a lot of questions there. So, and for sure, there are a lot of questions for many professions. Eh? Because like, uh, uh, and also, in, we are talking here not just executing the task, but we are also talking about potentially interactive systems. So there's a question also about like, uh, I don't know, you trust your accountant because your accountant is also able to, to provide you like some advice. Uh, about about certain type of of uh, uh, problems that you might have, but now the interactivity might might be might be possible. Might, we might have an agent that is interact with you and finds like a solution to your I don't know tax problem. So I think it's not it, it is a question of originality here and and on copyright, but it's also a question about the fact that we might have a replacement of certain activities that can be automated. And this is an, a specific type of automation, but it is a general question that I think we need, like, a, as a democratic institution, to ask of ourselves. And of course, the standard if we finish, we are, we are talking about, uh, a, let's say, like, in a, in a let's say good use, but uh, a not malicious use of these technologies, because, like, we, you might really uh, try to. Uh, misuse the technologies. We know, like, uh, like cre creating, like, uh, it's very, very easy to, to, to create uh, fake uh, videos and so on. So there is also a question there. So it is imitation that has also implications that are quite, uh, quite interesting from the point, of, from many, many point of views. Annette. Yeah, very, very interesting. I was also about to say that actually, even if you started from the input, we actually came to the output, and I think that's how it uh, has gone. So uh, the point, uh, as far as I've read about these uh, news uh, stories about the US cases, is that the output kind of is seen as infringing. So it's uh, e either direct copies or, or too near or so on. and. Um, and that's also the point where you get to a phase where it's actually uh, a question of replacing human uh, 
creativity or, or creative workers. Uh, the livelihood becomes an issue, the commercial part of, of media uh, becomes an issue, uh, the uh, kind of a paternity, I mean, this is the right to, to be named as the author, this becomes an issue, the, going to the source becomes the issue. So uh, these are big things, I think. Um, and also, like you said um, about the societal decision-making, of course, we need to somehow also see that this is somewhat a global issue, and we, we maybe have a quite like upper Western <laughs> outlook on this stuff, but also um, like malicious use that uh, brought to my mind the idea that uh, if we think about um, like AI uh, doing it all for us from now on, so is it all past probabilities? Uh, and not like future possibilities based on human experiences. Is that what we want? Isn't that malicious? I don't know. Um, and then actually with regard to this replacing human uh, creators, there has been discussions also in, in legal science that should it be actually so that uh, even if we would think that uh, training could be allowed, uh, would we still need to, when it comes to then commercial applications, to compensate, uh, to remunerate the authors, have some sort of systems where they get their money? <laughs> and, and then also uh, there has been research done on the kind of a training part uh, that should human rights be weighed, uh, so that if you do something that goes against human rights, that would not be okay, but it would be the more okay, the more human right uh, like, uh, it becomes. So this is also one kind of a scaling issue. And then uh, very legal stuff is also this, that uh, with regard to input, we have um, limitations and exceptions, like I uh, mentioned this, uh, text and data mining, but of course also output can, be, uh, we have limitations for parody, pastiche, that uh, rely on imitation and so on. So very many questions here. What do you think, Natalia, what is being discussed in the fashion industry about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that also a lot of questions, uh, more questions than answers, but I think that there has been already kind of copying is normalized in, well, in fashion, but also, I think, in other design industries or in uh, art as well, in a way. There has always been uh, some kind of copying there or inspiration from each other. So we've kind of been using already others' uh, works to do something else. And it's a very thin line when it's just inspiration or a, or a copy or and when it's something original and so on so but and and also the data about the input data there's <coughs> already a lot of data that has been used exploited for all sorts of pur purposes by the tech giants um, and others so in a way we have already had this problem for forever um, but I think the good question also here is um, as you both said, that who, who uses these technologies and for what kind of purposes and who kind of legitimizes these works that are done and why. So we have the society but we, and the law and we also have kind of small social worlds interconnected with each other. So we have, like, for example, we have art world or we have fashion world, and then there are always some people who decide what gets to become um, appreciated, what gets to become published, what, and so on. So it's, or, or who gets to have an exhibition. So we kind of already have, so it's, there is, is there much difference if I create and use AI for creating and use others' data and ex exploit others' data to create something in my uh, 
in my bedroom just for fun is this kind of who cares but <laughs> then <laughs> if it gets published and if the company uh, gets profit for it for example then and it, it really exploits someone's original input and some person has maybe spent their whole life developing this style or this concept or something kind of uses their personal history for that the kind of blood and sweat the person uses and then somebody just takes or the ai takes the surface and um, does something that imitates the output so of of the person so kind of the output is in a way different the output of a person and the output of a of an ai which resembles something but ai can be also tricky and creepy in a way that if a person who copies can be quite stupid so this copy is obvious and i think many uh, for example fast fashion companies have been they had to take away some of the products because a, a person just copied some independent designers work and then they were like uh, nobody knew that or they knew but they didn't care so it was taken away. but the ai can be most probably programmed in a way that it's not uh copy enough I'm sure <laughs> Mirko has <laughs> something to say that, but I could imagine that it could be kind of, in a way, in this in in this sense, in kind of more dangerous uh, for the independent creators. So, in a way, we're coming back to that. Even when a human being creates, like Mirko was already um, talking about, we kind of take everything else, inspiration, and then we produce something new. And now AI is doing it but the scale is very different and perhaps what comes out is also different, but go ahead. One thing that I think the cases that you mentioned have in common is that um, the model itself uh, is essentially generating something that is extremely close or is just repeating the original. I think New York Times is very worried because instead of buying the subscription to the archive to, of the New York Times, I can go to, on ChatGPT and get uh, the articles. And I think that it is really probably, then becomes a problem of, of copyright. So like, and I think then there will be a question also like of, like of the fidelity of, 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 of essentially regenerating or generating the content. If you take the artist that you were saying, it's like it will be a copy of, of the song. So I think we are going back to the, to the, to the original copyright laws there. So, and for that it's quite tricky, but these cases are quite interesting because like, at the same time, they might have, uh, like, I don't say that we might have a solution, but we might frame them when they, they become essentially systems for information retrieval, instead of like, it becomes sort of search engines, then, then, then there is a question about like, uh, of, of attribution. Okay? I, think, I think that is quite, quite, quite interesting there. But because like they become search engine, so these big models become some sort of compression of these articles that are just then decompress and we get essentially more or less the 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 content of a New York uh, Times article. That is a very fine line. Does this is this happening for all the articles? Uh, also, like when you when you cite, like for example, a New York. Uh, Times article, how do you cite it? What is like fair use? What, what about personal use? Uh, there, there, are, there might be content that is already available anyway. Maybe like uh, some, uh, so, some, some pages are available anyway. So there are a lot of questions there, but I see the problem there. But the, the problem is also because it's quite very close to imitation there and to information retrieval. In my opinion, in case of in the case of of, of uh, kind of a database, in the case of articles. Okay, we already have several audience questions, so this one continues on what we've talked about, and I think this would probably go for Annette. Um, with the new regulations from EU on using copyrighted materials, shouldn't that halt all the existing generative AI models already in use? considering they are all trained on copyrighted materials, are we to expect a full stop on generative AI soon? 
Um, no, well, I, I wouldn't put it that way. There are, of course, these um, like transparency requirements um, that should kind of uh, also enable the, the right holders, authors, to kind of get information what is behind and so on. But um, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't predict this. I, uh, but still, when I read the AI Act as it was approved, uh, my first thought was this kind of a practical implications. Because there is this idea, and like I said in my presentation, that um, they refer to kind of a, on a general level to this European copyright uh, law and, and the uh, text and data mining and so on. But I was uh, also reading in this kind of a level playing field idea uh, that all models that are like put to use in Europe uh, should do exactly that. So my... Um, mind just hasn't really grabbed the issue that what, what, what is the practical uh, kind of output, <laughs> the practical implications of this, because it sounds really big to me. Uh, and I, I don't really have an answer for that. But what was interesting in this um, originality question that you put in uh, was that, that that's, of course, also, in, in law, we have um, looked at the issue of originality very closely and researched and, and actually um, uh, have found out how it is like always you build on existing materials. That's like, that's just how we do things. But um, then, of course, comes the legal part where you look at... Uh, where, where you actually have done something that is, from a legal perspective, uh, far enough. <laughs> so this is very interesting, but with AI, you always have to then uh, take into account this, um, like I said, or colleague put it, hidden causation requirements, because we have the idea of, of human very human-centered copyright. We have the term of copyright lasting after death. It's death. Uh, of course, I don't know, AI can die, perhaps. But <laughs> still, um, and, and you have these moral rights and the personal touch thingy and so on. So it's very kind of a human-centered system. So with AI, we still, we have that. And if uh, if the machine produces something um, where you can still find enough of this uh, legal authorship, it becomes an issue which part in that expressive output result from the human uh, free and creative choices. So it can be that some parts are not protected, some parts are. So it's, it's very complicated issue, I think. And we have to take into account this uh, question also of, of licensing, uh, licensing different types of uses, of course. Well, let's consider the outputs then. So you're an artist, you go a fashion designer, and, and you prompt and out comes digital fashion. Is it as simple as that the copyright of that work is the persons who prompted AI, or could it be the software company creating AI, or the people who get images, whose images were used to train it? Who do you think, uh, we probably don't have a legal definition for this yet, or do we, Annette? But Sorry, I, Do we already, I... does law say something, does the EU Act say something about who owns the work that comes out? Is it automatically the person who prompted it? Uh, well, AI Act is not copyright-specific act. It's mm -hmm. kind of a horizontal regulation, but it came to include uh, references to copyright law. And like I said, ownership uh, is not really the word we use in mm -hmm. kind of a 
uh, copyright in the in the field of copyright because it's right holder. Uh, like I said, I can own a book, but I don't own the work in that book. Uh, the, the author is the copyright holder. Okay. So who holds yeah. the rights to the work that has been created with ChatGPT or uh, Midjourney? Well, like I said um, already, that at this point we would ne need to look at. Um, there's not like either or situation. It's more like case by case. If there is enough human uh, involvement, uh, I cannot rule out that uh, copyright wouldn't be there. But if it's so that the kind of the causation is uh, uh, somehow, it ceases at some point. For instance, we could think that uh, even if um, creative input would be on many places. Uh, the, even data collecting in, for some parts could, I don't know. Uh, but then uh, the designing of the system and all the, you have to make choices along the way. And not all those are like copyright relevant choices. But let's say that there is something copyright relevant uh, and then something else copyright relevant and then the machine does something that no one does what it, no one knows what it really does uh, that kind of uh, the end result then is a very complex issue to look at where the human input actually uh, where does it uh, go how far does it go in terms of copyright but basically, like I said, in, in European copyright, human author is always needed for copyright protection. Yeah, I came to think of, of, of there has been generative art or design or parametric design uh, for, for decades already. So in a way, in these types of activities, the designer or the artist uh, creates the parameters and the concept around it and then presents the work in some type of context, let's say an art exhibition or performance. So there, maybe what happens in that situation, whether it's some generative tool that creates something or uh, something is grown or some people, like audience is participating the performers and so on. Yes. So basically there are a lot of activities happening in <laughs> such situations, but then there is always this some kind of human or collective uh, that has kind of created the whole thing, the whole concept around it. So basically I could generate majority images and then put them in a particular context have an exhibition with some kind of theme that has some kind of concept behind it. So would I then be still the artist, even though the images are not mine? Because of course, artists have always, or many artists in let, let's say conceptual art have used images that are not done by them themselves. Somebody else has done those pictures. Maybe they're collected from magazines or something. So it's not the kind of artwork the artifact itself, but the whole idea behind the artifact. So these are kind of considered as, or are they considered as authors? But at least in the, in the art history books, they're considered as the authors of those things. Yeah, and of course the artworks. user can, can then uh, take the output farther. They can mm. modify that. So we of course have this positive side also of enhanced human creativity. You can use these very, in a very enhanced uh, manner and enhance your creativity. And then, of course, um, still we would have to see that have you taken it far enough for it to be totally copyrighted? Or are there parts that doesn't result from your human, these kind of creative free uh, choices? And that's also one thing, these creative and free choices that uh, kind of limits you when you have these functional uh, elements that you, you pointed out. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's really, really interesting. And of course, this uh, joint authorship or many authors, that's a question of its own. And we could also then, like on a general level, think that uh, 
neither one of the like individual parts would amount to authorship, but together they do, or, or how do we see it? Well, Mirko, we've talked a lot here about that from law perspective, the human touch is needed, but what do you think of um, AI's creativity? Could AI start soon without prompts creating its own works that could be considered, if not yet by law, but copyrighted material that the program used, created? Uh, there is a question uh, of, of acquiring knowledge there anyway. So usually you need to train your system on something. So clearly, once, as humans, we train uh, like through experience and uh, we train, like, well, in essentially, essentially, when you are a kid, uh, you, you acquire skills. It uh, can be like also manual skills, and then you, you, you acquire knowledge. You go to school, you go to art school, you, go to, you learn how to write. Uh, and this are, is a, an acquisition of skills. The acquisition of skills, I think, it, it, is the pro, it is the aspect related to probably also copyright, because uh, you are acquiring knowledge that might be also generated by others. Okay. Uh, like the generation itself of, uh, of uh, is essentially, it might be independent from humans. I think uh, it is something that we have already. Uh, potentially, we might, I uh, was talking about uh, the work uh, with, um, with Giorgio Franceschelli, uh, this work uh, uh, on uh, essentially finding new solution. To, this was essentially, play video games, like uh, that, that, that paper was about playing video games, finding new solution to, to problems by, by thinking and uh, yeah, like dreaming new solution, essentially. And dreaming new solution, like in, in, in technical terms, means essentially trying to add a noise or add variation, and we are able to do that. So and essentially, when you have a model that is pre-trained in a certain way, you can do that. There are questions also about like acquisition, because in theory, like we, we can also just uh, uh, have like, a, and this is the way more or less this system, maybe are trained in stages, but if you take a, a large language model, it would be possible, and actually we have already systems that do that in a way, system that essentially acquire information from the web, for example, and uh, automatically. So we have retrieval systems, okay? And you can do automatic retrieval of information so then you might also cut the humans out, potentially, also in retrieving information. You might also have, at a certain point, embodied systems that might have experiences and might, uh, say, go to the library or go to the museum, to the art museum, but more or less they might do that. So wh why not? Because like, it is something that it might become possible. It's not something that we should exclude and actually become very possible, like acquisition of information from the environment as well. So, I think it's possible, and I think it is, that is uh, just a matter of like, uh, seeing, the, seeing like, uh, if this is useful or not. But if you think about it, like, like uh, if you consider GPT-4, or like, or like Copilot, or Microsoft, uh, or also the system that essentially provide you cloud and so on, they provide you like, uh, links to website. So if we ask like, about this event, we might probably get a links to this event. You can also get a link for registration. And uh, like essentially, the system is able to find a solution, an original solution to how to uh, register for for the for the event at the Think Corner on on, on the on the third, third of April. So I think uh, you can also ask other things that might be more complex. So we are there, in my opinion. Uh, we're starting to get to the end of the time, so I want to take one last audience. Um, question and maybe then just brief comments. How would you comment, uh, comment on this quote? Uh, you know what the biggest problem with pushing all things AI is? Wrong direction. I want AI to do my laundry and dishes so that I can do art and writing, not for AI to do my art and writing so that I can do my laundry and dishes. <laughs> is this the problem with AI? It will take away all our creative, fun tasks and leave us with all the boring ones that we'd like to get rid of. What do you think? Brief um, comments, uh, Natalia. Oh, this was great. I just came across the same thing today and loved it because I think that's the way it is. I mean, 
we should really think the purposes for which the AI is, is the best and what kind of tasks we want it to do. And do we want it to do, um, do we want the efficiency that it promises? Uh, because it's also all about that. I also just read some article about like using it in games and how it can make the work of game designers fairly efficient. They make, can make so much more games in a very short period of time. Then like, do we need all these games? Like, do we need that stuff? Like whatever stuff it is, that, do we want uh, art and design generated by AI, or do we just want some particular people who we, we whose work we like? to do the few works, not efficiently. So I think that was a great thing. And I, I think um, it would be lovely if, if AI could do all the, the boring things and then humans could have time for, for the creative part. <laughs> what do you think, Mirko? So I think uh, I, like one of the characteristics of uh, civilization has been, I think, the transition from uh, like essentially surviving to expressing them ourselves as, as, a, as, a, as humans. So I don't know, like the, the paintings that you have in caves to, to like the generation of, of, of verse in, in, a, in a Shakespearean style of chat GPT or like mid journey. Uh, so we have uh, for sure, like something that uh, is uh, something that we enjoy is uh, is uh, also the sense of uh, expressing ourselves to uh, communicate to others, uh, to share experiences, because a lot of art and writing is about sharing. And uh, I think this will not, uh, uh, will not be replaced by, by AI for that reason, because I think uh, that is still something that we aspire to. And this is a good point of oh, oh, the person at home. It is like how to use this for, for social good. And, uh, and I think this is a, is, a, is, a, is a good question. And also automation, automation of the task, yes. And but then uh, we need to rethink uh, also like how to reorganize our, our societies when Potentially, uh, like some 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 some, some jobs and, and some something, it will be essentially replaced by 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 automation. And I think there will be like big questions. And I don't have a, a, like, like an answer because I think it is a very complex question. Again, I think we should uh, li like like be prepared. Be prepared because uh, like the evolution has been extremely quick. And like as a, if you want a technologist, uh, in my opinion, has been surprisingly quick. And think about how we will readjust to, because like, like, like the problem is like, like losing the possibility, okay, like, like, like solving like some, some like everyday problems, like, like the washing machine and, and, and so on, or like washing the dishes is one. The other problem is like when this essentially take away your job, and I think uh, that is uh, a question that we need to ask ourselves. Like, uh, it can be an artist's job. Uh, what are the implications? What we want to do? And uh, and sometimes we see, we also we also see in history that, uh, um, that there are some sort of points of no return. So where the pressure of of like that we have around, like from. Like, for example, it can be like some economic pressure, it can be some, the way our societies are organized uh, will not stop it, essentially. And uh, but deciding how, how, to, how to, uh, to proceed, I think, uh, will be like uh, fundamental. You have democratic involvement of people. I think that is important. It's also, I like this type of events because I think it is extremely important that people understand as well and also explain it. I always say that this should, should not be taught at university, this should, should be taught in primary schools. So kids, uh, like young uh, uh, people should be, should know and should understand because the thing that we don't want is that this will be decided by a selected few. And I think like 
involvement of people is important, uh, and we don't want even like to have a negative view of that, because like in my opinion, the AI Act is uh, is negative about many aspects of the technology, uh, without uh, real evidence at the moment. There might be risks, but this kind of of uh, assessment between risks and benefit, this trade-off and thinking about and it, it is like this. Uh, this aspect that was mentioned uh, also about like, the fact that we need to consider case by case, I think it is important. Because uh, otherwise you can also stop uh, like this big potential that is coming. Because uh, it's, kind of, it's really democratic AI as well. Uh, so there is an aspect of automation. There is an aspect of having, for example, education. Because, okay, they might contain textbooks that are copyright. But then, if you are anywhere in the world, if you are in the global south, and you are able to have a teacher that is teaching you, like math, it is teaching you calculus, physics, history, uh, fashion design, that is a, an extremely powerful tool that we have as a, as a civilization. Yeah, maybe just quickly, you pointed out this automation. So what is AI? What, what is AI when we talk about that? Some people actually might enjoy doing their laundry and dishes and not have them automated. So I think this is more of like a diversity issue in that regard that even uh, and when we talk about creativity, that we don't uh, let it become kind of a one-sided uh, machine-driven probability probabilistic kind of stuff, that we still have the human experience-driven uh, future possibilities and experiences uh, kind of culture. Thank you for the audience questions. Thank you for our panelists and keynote speakers. Um, the recording of this event will be available later at Alta University's YouTube channel. And I briefly want to tell you about the next discussion uh, in this series. It will take place on Tuesday, May 7th, and the topic will be, Can Computers Create Art? So we will continue on the themes that were already sort of raised here. The event will be in English. Uh, the experts in the next event are media artist Kyle MacDonald, senior university lecturer Tomis Lotte Duva and professor of computer science Hannu Toivonen. And the main point that I want you to now remember is that we're going to have uh, an art, AI artwork here at Think Corner created by Kyle McDonald that you can use before the event and you can book your slot to the experience to this piece already now, and I think, are we going to have the QR code on the wall that you can check, or do we have it? Yes, we have the QR code here, and you can, the stream will have the link as well. So if you're interested in trying out the piece that Kyle McDonald has created called Voice in My Head, you should book your slots so you're sure that you will get in. Uh, thank you everyone, and I hope to see you all at the next event. Thank you.